Right, hi, everybody. hi everybody, we are Propulsion Martian Energy Solutions and today we're going to talk to you about our design and optimization of a zinc bromine flow cell battery for long-term energy storage on Mars. As a company, we are committed to facilitating the colonization of Mars through unique energy solutions designed specifically for the Martian environment. As a company, we have John Bernard, Brendan Perlman, Matt Saba, who has unfortunately come down with scarlet fever and pneumonia, will be on slide decks today. Myself, Sarah Sid, and Stephen Watt. So, NASA has discussed in a recent publication that Mars is the next, that Mars is the next, <laughs> is the next tangible frontier for human presence. In their recent study, they discussed human the human independence as well as sustainability and harnessing of natural resources. Essentially, humans will be stepping foot on the red planet with the idea of colonization in mind. To achieve this step, significant technological advancements must first be realized. One, one of these is long-term energy storage with the use of intermittent energy sources. Nothing is currently on the market that's feasible, reliable, and safe. Both the unique environment on, on Mars as well as the transportation pose challenges to this design. We at Propulsion are seeking to advance this te these technological capabilities and develop a product that is viable for incorporation into a sustainable and renewable energy system that can be used during the colonization of Mars. So to begin, we're going to take a look at a little bit of background that will help you understand our final design. So first up is flow cell batteries. As you can see in figure one, the flow cell battery starts with the solar power which charges the battery. You have a positive electrode and a negative electrode tank, and the fluid is circulated through a reactor cell. In the reactor cell, you're going to have an ion selective membrane, and the transport of those ions is what's going to generate our power output, which can be used to power our um, colonization for when power is needed. So specifically on Mars, Mars has a very different atmosphere than what we are used to on Earth. The atmosphere is 0 0.006 atmospheres, which is almost a vacuum. And the surface temperature is actually a lot lower than what we're used to as well at negative 82 degrees Fahrenheit. The gravity is a third of what we're used to on Earth at 3.7 meters per second squared. So these three factors are definitely going to be a consideration in our final design as they are different from how a normal battery would operate on Earth. Another thing that we focus on on Mars is the soil composition. As you can see in figure two, the Martian soil has a variety of different elements in different amounts. So specifically, we have highlighted our zinc and bromine, which we have chosen to utilize for this battery. We'll go into why utilizing that so soil composition um, will create a strategic advantage for our battery when compared to others. Also, water will be required for, um, for use within our electrolyte solutions, and water is available on Mars through polar ice caps. And finally, we have dust storms. There are frequent dust storms on Mars. They can last for a while, and they can um, hinder the sunlight as well as pick up a lot of dust and generate hydro, uh, um, static pressure or hydrostatic um, charge buildup. So we have to consider that in our design. And finally is the McMurdo Antarctic Research Center. So McMurdo is an isolated research community. It's powered by a small nuclear power plant and it's built to sustain about a thousand people. And this plant is fully self-sustaining so we figured it would be the best thing on earth for us to model our battery off of since it's the closest thing that would mimic our um, civilization that would be on Mars. Um, so the power requirements for this McMurdo station are 16,000 megawatt hours per year and a peak power output about 2.1 megawatts. And the energy requirements are, um, an average for a 12 hour is 22 megawatt hours. So we'll utilize those numbers later. Okay guys, I'm going to talk about the base case design now. So multiple battery chemistries were studied before we finally chose our zinc bromine chemistry. Iron chromium, vanadium, vanadium, and zinc bromine are among the most well-studied um, flow, flow cell batteries in the literature. And we ultimately decided on um, uh, zinc bromine because of the availability, availability of the materials on Mars. In a zinc bromine battery, during charging, um, uh, elemental bromine is evolved at the cathode and zinc is electroplated at the anode. This process is reversed dur during discharging where Bromine is reduced to bromide ions and zinc is oxidized to zinc ions. The net cell potential of a zinc bromine battery is 1.841 volts during charge. Zinc bromine batteries feature high energy storage capacity and high charge discharge rates. However, the power and energy components are decoupled, which means we can scale them independently, which is a major advantage of flow cell batteries. Earthbound companies have demonstrated grid scale energy storage capabilities of zinc uh, bromine 
and long lifetimes of five to 10 years or roughly 5,000 full cycles. Spectroscopic studies have proven the existence of zinc and bromine on Mars, so that drastically reduces the launch cost to send our system to Mars, which is a major advantage that we'll develop further. Also, the battery is modular in design, so energy and power requirements can easily be modified. So as Sarah talked about, McMurdo Station is as good a model as anywhere else on Earth for our initial power and energy calculations. So the max power output is 2.1 megawatts at McMurdo, so we use this number as our power requirement. The average 12-hour energy capacity need at McMurdo is 22 megawatt hours, so we use this our, as our energy capacity requirement. Uh, in the literature, zinc bromine energy density is 39 watt hours per liter, so we use a conservative estimate of 30 watt hours per liter, along with a 70% round trip efficiency to calculate the minimum tank volume of 400,000 liters per tank. So uh, after our base case design, um, we wanted to do uh, experimental val validation of our chemistry um, and see if we could uh, gather some parameters uh, about our chemistry to more appropriately model it uh, moving forward. So. Um, Real quickly, uh, the major characteristics uh, required for electrochemical modeling um, are thermodynamic considerations, uh, kinetic parameters, and transport parameters. Um, thermodynamic parameters are pretty easy to look up. Um, they're abundant in tabulated data, so we didn't need to, to look at that specifically. Um, we focused uh, more in kinetic and transport parameters um, during our experiment. Uh, our experiment itself, uh, involved dissolving zinc bromine into water, um, which is the solution we would be using uh, for this battery, and then using a rotating disc electrode. Um, by varying uh, the voltage, sweeping the voltage on that electrode, um, and varying the rotational rate of the electrode, um, we'd be able to determine uh, through Toffel plots uh, the reaction kinetics, and through Kentucky Levage plots the transport phenomena of our, uh, uh, of our reaction. So this is uh, what the raw data looks like. Um, as you can see, voltage on the x-axis um, is sweeped back and forth. Um, and we have current on the y-axis, um, which is corresponding to whatever voltage we put that cell at. So um, we found our half reaction potential about uh, negative 0.9 volts. Um, this is in reference to a silver-silver chloride uh, reference electrode. Um, Above, in the positive voltage, uh, you see the stripping region, uh, or sorry, positive current, excuse me, you see the stripping region. Um, this would be indicative of battery discharging. Um, and below is the plating region, uh, and that's the region in which charging is occurring. So um, taking that raw data, we were able to plot uh, the log of current density uh, against the over potential. Um, and taking uh, tangents to these uh, these two plots um, in a roughly linear region, we were able to uh, fit these lines to the Toffel equation, which can be seen here. Um, by, by solving uh, the equation, we were able to find that the exchange current density is about 0 0.15 milliamps per square centimeter, um, and the transfer coefficient is about 23 milliamps per square centimeter. Uh, moving on, we were also able to take this data um, and create Kentucky Levage plots. Uh, this uh, is uh, shown right here. It plots the inverse uh, square root of the rotational rate um, against the inverse of the current measured. Um, and by taking <coughs> the slopes and averaging them, um, as well as uh, averaging the intercepts of these lines, we are able to uh, fit it to the Kentucky Levage equation seen here, um, as well as use known values uh, the charge per uh, electrons per mole of reaction, Faraday's constant, the area of the electrode, um, the kinet kinematic viscosity, and the concentration used, um, and, and uh, find the actual uh, average kinetic current density and average diffusion coefficient, which were 15 uh, milliamps per centimeter and 31.6 times 10 to the negative 6 centimeters squared per second, respectively. So uh, finally, we wanted to discuss dendrite formation. Um, reading in the literature, we found that dendrite formation is a, uh, a significant concern with this type of battery system. Uh, whenever plating is involved, it, it usually is. Um, we found that actually uh, 
the dendrite formation was um, more prevalent and more problematic than initially uh, anticipated. As you can see here, you can quite visibly see uh, the reaction occurring and the dendrites forming on the rotating electrode. Um, this plot here shows uh, the initial plating of zinc prior to measurements. Uh, you need to plate zinc onto the electrode to make sure that uh, it's not depleted when taking uh, reaction measurements. Um, as you can see, there's an initial spike in current um, when there's no zinc on the platinum electrode, uh, and that slowly uh, reduces as uh, zinc covers that electrode. Um, what's important here is this downward slope on the graph. Uh, that's indicating increasing current as time progresses. Um, this suggests that the area of zinc um, as it forms dendrites creates greater reaction area um, and is influencing actually the, perf uh, the performance and, and measurements that we're taking. Um, so this shows that it is something we need to consider um, moving forward in our battery design and, and that dendrite formation is uh, probably a primary concern um, when actually designing a reaction cell. So next we're going to take a look at our final design solution. So first up, we're going to start by taking a look at our process and instrumentation diagram. So as you can see on the left, we have our catholite tank, um, which is going to have our bromine solution, and then our analyte tank on the right, which is going to have our um, zinc bromine salt. So th the fluid will be flowing along these dark blue lines through the center battery stack, and we have our um, electric lines drawn in red, which will come from the solar farm, and then some of them will be used for the electric heating, and then out through our power output. So to discuss some of our... Um, process controls that we've had, have implemented for safety purposes. The first is temperature. Um, we are obviously operating at a very cold temperature and we would like to be operating in um, liquid form so we want to keep our solutions at an optimal temperature. Um, so we will be implementing temperature control loops on both tanks um, which will operate in conjunction with the electric heaters to ensure that our process is remaining in the liquid state. We also have temperature high and low alarms to alert operators in case that we do reach um, either extreme because we don't want to be vaporizing as well as freezing our um, solution. Additionally, the catholite tank has an added risk. The bromine is something that wants to remain in the vapor phase and not in the liquid phase. So we have the issue of um, vaporization and overpressurization of the tank. So we have implemented um, a pressure control loop as well on that tank to control that pressure and ensure that our, um, ensure that our temperature is remaining in at the proper temperature to make sure that our pressure is remaining at our desired set point. But in case of emergency, we do have a pressure relief valve on that tank. Additionally, along the flows, we have our filters, um, which will be collecting any extra particles or dendrites that happen to fall off um, or detach from our battery stack. And we also have pumps that will be pumping the fluid around. Um, around these areas, we have flow control to ensure that the process flow is at our desired output. If the process flow changes at all, it could um, fluctuate our power output, which is something that's undesired. And finally, we have our um, battery stack in the center with pressure indicators to ensure that the pressure is remaining at its desired set point and that there is no overpressurization or harm to our battery stack. So next, we're going to take a look at some of the safety concerns. Our two electrolyte solutions are pretty much where the biggest safety concerns come from. Um, the zinc bromide salt being less of a concern than the bromine solution, but still a concern. Um, it is something that should be avoided contact with skin and shouldn't be swallowed as well as it is toxic to aquatic life. While we aren't sure right now if there is any on, on Mars, we should be careful of potentially harming any Martian fish that we would encounter. Um, additionally, the bromine solution is much more of a risk. Um, bromine poisoning can be very fatal and it targets specific organs in the body, so it's very dangerous if inhaled. So we must avoid all contact with these solutions, um, as well as it can produce toxic gases if fire, so explosion is something that needs to be considered as well. We conducted a full FMEA analysis to ensure that we had all of our process controls needed in place to make sure that we were mitigating all of our potential failure modes. And I'm just gonna go through three briefly that we found to be critical and that we needed mitigating action for. The first of which is the filling of our tanks. This is a pretty key spot because if we have any issues with the filling of our tanks, we could potentially have release of our electrolyte solutions, which as I mentioned is pretty dangerous. So we have implemented charging and discharging ports on both tanks with flow control. So we can ensure that the operators are charging the proper amount of material into the tank and spilling is not gonna be of a concern. Additionally, we have just traditional cathlite and analyte um, tank operation. 
Um, as I mentioned, we have that risk of overpressurization, um, which could potentially lead to tank rupture. That is something we obviously ex would really like to avoid, considering um, the spill of that electrolyte solution is extremely dangerous. We have implemented our high pressure alarms to ensure um, that we are alerting operators if our pressure is starting to creep up. Additionally, we have the pressure control loops to, um, to utilize the temperature to kind of offset that temperature change, as well as we do have the pressure relief valve if it does come to that. The cathode and anode battery stack operation is the third. Um, we, this is a pretty crucial part of the battery as it's where we're producing our power output. So we do not want to have any failures within this area. Um, there's a potential for overpressurization, membrane failure, or just uneven plating. Um, and all of these could hinder the battery function. We would have a drop in power output, and it could pot potentially do harm to the physical structure of our battery. Um, so it's very important that we have implemented some mitigating actions for these. The first is implementing those high pressure um, indicators on both stacks to ensure that the pressure is where it, sh it should be, as well as we will be implementing online monitoring of both the power and the plating to ensure that they are meeting the desired demands. The two 400,000 liter tanks are composed of four layers. The base structure is an expandable polypropylene bladder. We chose polypropylene for its chemical compatibility and launch considerations. This bladder is then reinforced with Kevlar to provide structural integrity. Next is a thick uh, foam insulation layer to mitigate heat loss to the atmosphere. The Martian atmosphere is extremely thin, which drastically reduces the convective heat loss. However, it offers little to no protection against solar radiation, so we added an outer layer of mylar sheath to protect against solar radiation. The cell itself is made of carbon plastic, and the membrane is um, polypropylene. All piping, pumps, and control valves were fitted for 8 inches inner diameter, which was calculated using engineering tables. So for the flow rate calculation through the cell, we use the literature value of 39 watt hours per liter. Again, we use a conservative estimate of 30 watt hours per liter and tacked on the 70% round trip efficiency. So using the 2.1 megawatt power um, requirement, we have a flow rate through the battery of 100,000 liters per hour. So for the heat loss calculations, we obtained heat, material heat transfer coefficients and use a literature value for the convective heat transfer coefficient on Mars. Um, we considered three shapes for heat loss, uh, spherical, domed, and cylindrical. So while the spherical and dome shapes mitigated heat loss the most because they minimized the surface area to volume ratio, um, we chose the cylindrical shape be for added structural integrity. And you can see that the difference in heat loss is negligible compared to our 2.1 megawatt battery power output. So for a cylindrical tank, we are limited to a height of four meters because of hydrostatic constraints of the tank. So this puts our radius at 5.64 meters and our surface area at 342 square meters for uh, overall heat loss to the atmosphere of 7.1 watts. This is way less than 1% of our battery power output, so we're not too worried about it. So uh, moving forward, uh the battery cell design, um, we took into consideration both uh, values we found during our experiment as well as uh, literature values. Um, so we found that the single cell voltage was about 1.67 volts um, and a max stack voltage uh, of about 100 volts was uh, the highest we saw in any uh, research papers that we, we looked at. Um, so we figured that anything below that would be appropriate for our battery. Um, and finally, a current density of about 20 milliamps per square centimeter um, was used at 2.5 molar solution. Um, so we, we use that as kind of a, a baseline for sizing um, the, the size of our uh, electrode um, in our stacks. So uh, using the 1.67 volt per cell um, value uh, that we found, um, we, we decided a 50 cell sack would be appropriate, resulting in an 83.5 volt, uh, volt per cell uh, value, which is below 100 volts. Um, furthermore, we, we decided that each stack should be about one meter um, square, and using the 20 milliamp per square centimeter value, um, we calculated that about 130 stacks would be needed to get 2.1 megawatt um, of output power. So again, to reiterate, that's 50 cells per stack, one square meter per stack, and 130 total stacks for the total um, reaction component of our system. Um, 
In table six uh, above, you can see uh, the different components that we need to consider and the materials for those components that would be uh, integrated into our stack. All right, so it's been a bit of a crescendo for the last 20 minutes, but now we're here. Um, I hope you guys are all excited to see how we visualize our system, what it looks like, and how we modeled it. So first and foremost, Steve mentioned that we're going to have these very large tanks, approximately 400,000 liters in volume, and they're going to be wrapped in a mylar sheath to protect against radiation and also insulate the fluid as it moves through the system. Um, as you can see, this is a cylindrical section of the tank, and the supports are very, very significant for the dust storms that we are accounting for. Um, there could be extremely high winds on Mars, and so these tanks need to be supported. Moving forward, so John just mentioned the cells. What are they actually going to look like? Well, this is one cell broken apart and exploded for you. Um, as you can see, moving from top down, we have the end block, terminal electrode. We have separators and screens, and then in this section right here is what a typical cell would look like. So moving over to the right side, we have 50 of those cells stacked together. This is what our cell stack is going to look like, and there's going to be a 10 by 13 array of these stacks fit into the system. So we want to house these stacks and also provide an area for flow and for pumping to be um, to go through the system. This is what we visualize is just a, a large box, essentially. Um, if I were to stand next to this box for a little bit of scale, it would be a little over twice the height of, of me. I'm about six foot on a good day. Um, <laughs> anyways, this is a closed system and also, again, protects the stacks from the dust, the wind, everything that we are accounting for in the Mars environment. I'll give you a second to absorb. I know it's, it's not. All right. Um, so moving from left to right here, this is our this is our full system visualized in a Martian setting. That we tried. Um, anyways, uh, mylar wrapped on this. We have mylar on the container as well, again for radiation, dust, wind, insulation concerns, and there's some piping. Um, the piping is to scale. It's eight inch diameter, Schedule 20 piping, all stainless steel, um, and. Uh, we believe that this is a very efficient way to set up the system. There's going to be wind, there's going to be dust, and keeping everything close and, and wrapped in insulation is, is a good and easy, efficient way to set up our system. Right, so you've seen how we visualized it. How are we going to identify ourselves in the market, and, and what is that market, really? So we did some research, and we tried to find some competition, and what, what other competitors could be you know, entering the emerging market of Martian colonization and power mode. <laughs> so first we looked at other zinc bromine batteries. There are several companies right now producing for residential um, scales. So um, first and foremost would be Redflow, a company located in Australia. However, their system is very small. It's, they have systems ranging from 10 to 25 kilowatt hours in energy. And so they would have to do some serious research and further design improvement to get to the scale that we're at on the megawatt hours and, and providing for a large scale civilization. Moving to other alternative powers, we looked at nuclear power. So several years ago, um, NASA looked into developing a nuclear reaction cell to, for use on, uh, in colonizing Mars. This was about 10 kilowatt hours, um, small scale, but modular and scalable. However, there are some very immediate and significant safety concerns with, with a nuclear fission reactor. Um, first, I mean, we, we're, we're going to be transporting on a rocket to Mars. so. Putting a nuclear power generator on a, on a rocket is, is a little concerning, and also there's radiation concerns if the system were to fail. So we overlooked this, and that's, again, why we, we looked to zinc bromide instead. Moving towards geothermal power, right now the InSight rover from NASA is drilling a, a small hole in Mars, looking to find identify the components of the core of Mars to see if geothermal power is possible, and also for research purposes. Um, it, it is known that it is a cooler core, and so we think it is solid and geothermal may be out of the question. However, we're going to wait for research and results from that. Finally, there are many, many producers of lithium ion batteries, Tesla, Panasonic, Samsung, just to name a few. Uh, they produce lithium ion batteries for small scale, you know, in your phones, up to the car, up to grid scale energy storage. However, these, um, these lithium ion batteries, they're not very scalable and they're heavy. So on the figure on the right, you can see in orange is a lithium ion battery and blue is a zinc bromine battery, and the axes are cost on the Y and hours of energy storage on the X. As you can see, lithium ion is, is pretty steep in slope, and as you try to scale it, it does get more expensive to ship. This is, we assumed, uh, per kilogram cost um, produced by SpaceX to transport um, materials. The zinc bromine, on the other hand, we would only need, well, once you have the cell container, all you need for scalability is adding electrolyte fluid. So that is why the slope is smaller. You don't need to multiply the entire system. Rather, you just need to add electrolyte to the system. 
All right, so we would like to, we, we see ourselves as selling directly to consumers, and these would be we, large consumers. We're talking SpaceX, Tesla, companies that are, are going to be, you know, implementing systems on Mars. So they have to be willing and able to commit investments and funding to our project. We're going to offer design and consulting services. So there are several things that we are considering out of scope of this project. One of those being production of the electrolyte on Mars. This could potentially be a future capstone project. Right now, we are just taking into account the immediate storage and cell design for our project. For design and consulting, we're going to offer safety concern. We're going to offer um, customer service for safety, for design implementation, for scalability, for modularity. We're hoping to really, in in the event that there are other competitors in the market, to you know separate ourselves from the competition. And finally for mitigating any production and shipping costs from to and from the uh, manufacturing location to where the rockets will be taken off, we're going to be located approximately an hour away from Cape Canaveral. This will really help to minimize those costs. And now, most importantly, the economics. Is this investment worthy? What are we looking at here? So on the left side, on the top, we have the capital costs. These are the fixed costs of producing the facility and initial um, investment costs. Moving down, we have production costs. So these, as you can see, are five units. So that's five large cell containers with the stack assemblies inside and 150 associated tanks. This is for scalability. You don't have to have a one-to-one -one ratio of tanks to cells. So the total cost of these is shown. And taking into account utilities and labor, um, it'll be a small manufacturing facility. There won't be a ton of labor concerns. Um, and the total yearly costs we're seeing around $235 million. Again, this is for a system that would be providing power to approximately 5,000 people if you take into account five total cells. Um, and so factoring in some economic factors and looking at the profit, there is profit to be had after a tax rate of 35% is accounted for. We are seeing a profit of nearly $19 million. That's going to conclude the technical area of our project. However, very importantly, we'd like to recognize some, some very significant people to making this project a success. First, our mentor, our leader, our guide, Dick. We'd like to, we'd really like to recognize you for everything that you've done for this project. Um, you've been there, you know, the whole way, and I think we have a little gift that we'd like to give you at, at this point. Oh, I love just what you were a great team. That's great to hear, and thank you very much. We, we are very appreciative of what you've done over the last couple of months. You know, coming up from Cape Cod when you can, being here, this was you know this was a surprise and very much welcome. Thank you. Moving next to Dr. Galloway, uh, we were surprised. I didn't know you were going to be here. This is awesome. We're very happy that you were able to be here, and we'd like to recognize you for providing your support early on, uh, aiming us and guiding us. You know, for picking a project and you know what battery system to really look at, and also um, your your students Ben and Lee as well as Matt and John's um, uh, <laughs> co-worker in the lab, um, AJ, who helped to you know, ensure the experimental validation went well, and you know, that enabled our proof of concept to, to make it to this, this final area. Next and final, uh, honorable Dr. Professor Courtney Fluger. Obviously, you've been you know, a big support for everybody here, and you're, you know, your seeking excellence has really, really helped us to ensure that we're finding excellence and perfection in this project. So that, that support's been invaluable, and we're really, really grateful for everything you've been able to do for us. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. So we'd like to open it up for questions um, from anyone in the audience. Yes, Chris. This is such a unique concept. How did you guys come up with it? Um, I think uh, I speak for all of us when we say uh, we really wanted to do something unique and something fun. Um, we were interested in energy storage and we were looking for an application um, that was kind of novel and creative. Um, at looking at the, the composition of the Martian soil, we were able to find there was a well-studied battery chemistry that could be um, done with that and so our idea kind of took off from that. How did you competitive, what con competitive benchmarks did you use to value your product? Right, so we looked at um, weight of the system with and without electrolyte. 
which some systems, they have to include electrolyte at this point. They haven't taken into design considerations for producing electrolyte on Mars, which ours does. So it's immediately lighter than other systems that are of the same scale, which are few and far between to begin with. Um, in addition to that, we looked at power and energy concerns and scalability. So most flow batteries, are all, they're all scalable. Um, if you add electrolyte, you're adding power and energy to the system. Um, however, again, we, we were looking at the competitive advantage of the composition of the electrolyte. So having zinc and bromine, which is readily available on Mars, whereas some other components, vanadium, vanadium, iron, chromium, they're not so readily available. So being able to produce that on Mars, save on the weight, was a very, very beneficial factor for us in our design. How did you price your product? We, we actually compared it to um, a vanadium flow battery and the cost per kilowatt there and then adjusted the cost based on the different materials. Okay. So you have 130 of those tanks, is that correct? So there's um, 50 cells stacked in uh, series, right, to uh, create that one large cell stack, um, and then there's 130 of those within this um, enclosure this here, along with pumps, piping, power electronics. So this is all that's required for your... your so this is enough for a 1,000 person colony. Yeah. Yes. Parable to McMurdo. Okay. Do the size of the tanks, does that concern like shipping that to Mars? Can you fit that? Yeah, so we took that into account. Obviously, it's a large volume. Um, we mentioned that they're going to be inflatable, right? So you can take um, a flexible rubber reinforced with Kevlar um, and have that shipped to Mars in a small, relatively small volume as they're deflated. Um, and then the actual pressure from the liquid inside um, will inflate those tanks to, to be rigid when filled. Professor cool. Gallagher. Would there, uh, I don't know anything about tanks. So this is, this is also about the tanks. Would there be any benefit in having uh, many uh, smaller tanks instead of two big tanks? So, uh, how does that? How does one make that decision? Um, the decision we uh, made to have large tanks um, is primarily uh, due to the heat loss concerns. Um, so obviously, Mars is very cold, and we need to keep our electrolytes um, above freezing. Uh, so. What we looked at is, is maximizing the surface area to volume ratio, so that heat loss compar comparable to the uh, volume of the, the solution used um, would, would be optimized. Um, so in theory, right, uh, it wouldn't really uh, change system performance too much to have smaller tanks, um, but you could expect uh, greater heat losses from that. Uh, first one is, so you mentioned that there are actually elements on Mars that you could use as part of your batteries. Yes. Yes. Uh, however, are they in the form that you need them to be or at the purity that you would need for these batteries? So yeah, we, we looked in a little bit about how these elements are, um, how they use them on Earth. So the process isn't too complicated. So on Earth, they take zinc that's combined with loads of other minerals in the rock and they ball mill it first and then they use filtration to separate mostly zinc oxide or sorry mostly zinc with the other minerals but they try and get as much zinc as possible at first then they roast it with air at 1300 K so that um, is a concern getting enough air on the Martian colony but we think a colony that has people is going to have air figured out and that turns it to zinc oxide where it's reacted with sulfuric acid to get zinc sulfate and then that is, um, there's electrolysis to separate the zinc from the sulfate and you get elemental zinc. To add to that, um, the actual data that we have about the zinc and the bromine in the Martian soil um, is not uh, super complete. We don't know exactly in what form that exists, right? Um, and, and what compounds that might be uh, existing in on Mars. We assume it's similar to what we see on Earth. Um, but that's not something that we can really speak to with super strong confidence at this time. Uh, we know that elementally it's there, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's kind of what we based our, our work off of. Okay. Another thing is the refinement of zinc and bromine is another reason we chose the battery, because it's a lot less uh, energy and a lot lower temperatures than it would be for iron or chromium mm -hmm. or titanium if we were to do that, so it made it 
more reasonable to be something produced online. Okay. Sounds like a great project for Capstone 2. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thanks, uh, I think we have, okay, sorry, I thought it was right. I can keep going. So uh, did you use your experimental energy density values for your scale-up design? The ex uh, so from our experimental results, um, that wasn't one of the things we were able to, to gather, right? Um, the reason being, uh, the cells in the field are run at higher concentration, um, 2.5 molar. Um, experimentally, we couldn't test it at such a high concentration. The reason being the zinc dendrite formation. The higher the concentration was, the more we got on the rotating electrode. Um, and as the zinc formed, as I mentioned earlier, it uh, created increased area, which is increased reaction rate and increased current, and it kind of uh, muddied our data. Um, so we used a lower concentration during experimentation, so it's not necessarily representative of uh, the power, what the power would be on an actual system. You got me. <laughs> um, do you foresee crossover or self discharge being an issue with the membrane at all? Uh, yeah, it uh, is a minor concern. Um, I think, luckily, the, the zinc bromine chemistry, from what we've read, um, is, is pretty good about self discharge, right? Um, compared to other systems, uh, it's not something we looked into too strongly. Um, but would definitely be some a component we'd have to consider in the future. But from what we've we've researched, it isn't of a major concern. Uh, other flow battery systems have more issues with it than ours. Okay, I'll go on. Um, mine's uh, a question about your P&ID. Um, so I'll, I'll ask the the design first, which is, you said you had a filter? Yeah. So uh, filters are right here, and right here, and right here. Great. Um, have you designed a way to get access to those filters? Like yeah, so everything you... we've, we've planned on, um, so all the, the components, um, except for the tanks, are, are going to be in that main rectangular enclosure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we anticipate keeping that at uh, a human habitable temperature and pressure um, in, in order to allow the system as a whole um, to be easily maintainable and accessible. So um, that's our plan. Uh, and, and we figured that keeping at least as much as of the system as possible out of the marsh environment so that someone could maintain the system and not have to be in a spacesuit um, would probably be best for our project. Yeah, just looking at the types of filters being access to them. Yeah. I, I actually have a question about the filters too. Um, so as someone who's made batteries like this before, uh, the dendrites that break off, uh, that's actually a big concern. Uh, yeah. you, you get a lot of those. Um, what ha so you go change the filter and there's a bunch of dendrites in there. Um, what are you going to do with that? Um, that's actually a great question. Uh, we added the filters after experimentation um, because we saw just that. Uh, the dendrites often wouldn't stay on the electrode. And once dendrites fall off the electrode, um, they're not able to then be, I guess, uh, stripped from it electrochemically. So that reduces our ability to, um, to discharge the cell, right? And that was factored into in our efficiency in theory, the zinc that we gather from a filter um, should be pure zinc um, and could be repurposed uh, for, for later use in um, electrolyte production. Um, it would be a, a pretty simple and cost-effective way, as opposed to mining totally new zinc when making new electrolyte, to just take the, electro, uh, the zinc that um, we gathered in the filter and, and combine it with bromine from, uh, from production. So. Do uh, z uh, these dendrites occur in uh, vanadium flow cell batteries? Is no, they don't. Um, they don't. They they do occur in ours because um, our chemistry involves electroplating the zinc, so generating solid zinc. Um, the vanadium flow cell batteries uh, stay liquid um, through all states. Can you 
repurpose um, uh, the dead drives that on your filter? Can you make an impact element? Well, so yeah, that's uh, what I was um, just discussing. It, it's a source of pure zinc, right? So rather than uh, processing and purifying zinc from the soil, um, all dendrites collected in the filters, right, um, should be pure solid zinc. So that could easily be repurposed um, and, and utilized in uh, additional electrolyte production. So when uh, the filters are changed or when the, the, uh, the electrolyte solution needs to be uh, changed, um, after X amount of years, of whatever service lifetime we end up getting from our battery, we predict around five to 10 years, um, that could be repurposed. So. All right, with that, we'll say thank you. Thank you.